And at this point, we'd like all the candidates to come up and take your seats, please. Tight. <laughs> you got to be good nice. pals tonight. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again so much for coming out on this great summer night. City Club and the Seattle Times make a very strong partnership. Last week, we joined together to stage the county executive debate. That was out at um, Maidenbauer Center in Bellevue. It was hosted and moderated by C.R. Douglas, who's over there, and Lynn Varner, my colleague from the Seattle Times. They're sitting together. I think that one must have worked out pretty well. <laughs> it was a kind of a prim and proper luncheon that we had over there, very lovely. I was delighted that City Club invited me to co-moderate this debate with the whole happy hour. I wanted my audience to be in a better mood. <laughs> The real truth is we scheduled this mayoral debate tonight because it was the only way we could think of to get Seattle Mayor Greg Nichols off the Sound Transit trains. <laughs> all, all in good jest here. Uh, so give me a chance here to introduce all the candidates. Many of them are known to you, but I will just go through. Starting with James Donaldson. He's a businessman, former Seattle supersonic. Sort of hurts to say supersonic, doesn't it? Uh, Jan Drago, city council member for 16 years and the current chairwoman of the Transportation Committee. Joe Malahan, the T-Mobile executive you're hearing so much about. He was a community organizer in Chicago, he likes to say, because that's a kind of a hot resume item there. <laughs> Mike McGinn, former chairman of the Sierra Club and founder and director of the Seattle Great City Initiative. Mayor Greg Nichols, our current mayor, who's very good natured when I say all these things at these <laughs> events. He was first elected in 2001. He is now seeking a third term. And Norman Stigler on the end, who is a corporate recruiter and a professional matchmaker. Thank you all so much for coming out here. Uh, I was interested in that. I was thinking about that. So, so let me go through the rules here because there's, there's several of them. The general flow of this this evening for all of you, each candidate is going to have a chance to give an opening statement. There will be two rounds of individualized questions, each of those followed by a round of a single question posed to all the candidates. Between those two rounds will be City Club, they love this, the lightning round, in which the candidates will be, do you have those? Yes, okay. Will be allowed to answer only by holding up a card that says yes, no, or waffle. Please don't hold up all three, that's too hard to track. We will then take questions from the audience before the candidates make closing statements. So about the audience guidelines for this evening. Please hold all applause until the end of the program. At the appropriate time, you will be asked, you in the audience who have things to say, questions to ask, to raise your hand and indicate that you would like to ask a question we have a mic tender, Ed Walker. I don't see him at this moment, but I know he's here. So he'll be very visible at that point. Each, each questioner will be asked to give their name before stating their question. Now let's define what a question is. A question <laughs> is something like 30 seconds, and it's not a statement. It's really a question. We do prefer questions asked to individual candidates so that with so many candidates, we don't have to go so much up and down the aisle. So that's. That's the way that's gonna go, and I pass it off to you. We're gonna begin with opening statements, and we'd like each of you to tell us what is the single issue that drew you to the race. And we'll begin with you, Norman Sigler. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Norman Sigler. Uh, I'll start with the answering that question. The single issue that drew me to this race was uh, fresh leadership. We need fresh leadership in the city uh, we need leadership that's forward-looking and not looking back over the issues in the past. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm 42 years old. I moved to Seattle six years ago as a manager of maintenance, finance, and contracts, 
at Alaska Airlines. I worked there for several years and then decided to move back into my uh, passion, which is recruiting, bringing people together with great corporate opportunities. And my matchmaking is uh, bringing people together with great people. So fresh leadership is while I'm, while I'm in the race. And I'm looking forward to telling you more about my outlines for the city of the future, Seattle. Thanks. Greg Nichols, in 45 seconds, tell us the single issue that brought you to this race. Well, thank you, Russ, and thank you to City Club for bringing us all together on this beautiful evening. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, the last uh, eight years, uh, I've been just extraordinarily honored to serve as mayor of this city, a city that has such strong progressive values and a progressive tradition. And it has been my pleasure to be able to put those values into action, leading the effort to renew the Seattle housing levy, re leading the effort to renew the uh, family and education levy, leading the effort to build light rail, which we opened up uh, last Saturday, making sure that we took care of people who were without. We've built a great record of accomplishment together. It is uh, my hope in the next four years that we build upon that and take the city uh, even further forward. Mike McGinn, what single issue brought you to the race? I think what we've seen is that we face really tough economic times. We already know we face extraordinary environmental and social challenges already, too. And what drew me to the race is I don't believe we can just keep doing what we've been doing and hope everything works out. Um, these changes are not, you know, bumps in the road. These are, a world economy is changing around us, and we have to transform as well. So that means we have to make really smart choices about what we invest in, and I've laid those out in my platform. We have to make pretty smart choices about what we don't spend money on as well. And we have to figure out how to tap into the talent and creativity and intelligence of all the people in Seattle so that we can hit those multiple goals of having a city that thrives economically, that's fair to everyone, and meets our environmental ideals. Joe Mellahan, the single issue that brought you to the race. Well, first I want to say Norm Sigler brought Jan and I together. We're still working that one out. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Mallahan. I'm uh, running for mayor because I believe city government is broken. And when I say that, I really mean delivery of basic services. And we need a mayor that we can trust. Uh, I was born and raised here in the Northwest. I'm seven out of nine children, raised in a working class family, taught the values of hard work, integrity, and service to others. I have 20 years of business experience and a long track record in business of bringing diverse groups of people together to solve complex problems. And I think I have the management experience and the values uh, that can make me a mayor that you all can trust. I look forward to talking to you more. Jan Draco, the single issue that brought you to the race. Well, thank you for hosting this this evening. Um, I believe that Seattle needs new leadership. It's time to hit that reset button. And I believe that we need to restore the relationships with our citizens, with our neighborhoods, with our regional and state uh, leaders. Seattle's changed. Washington State has changed. It's not the old days of Maggie and Scoop where they brought the bacon home. Today, it's about partnership. Everything the city does, it's in partnership. And it's with our neighborhoods, it's with our regional leaders, it's with the state and federal leaders. And I believe that my style of leadership can restore those relationships and build a better future for Seattle. James Donaldson, what's the single issue that tops your list? Thank you, James Donaldson, candidate for mayor. As a 30-year Seattle resident, I realized that after so many years spending on boards and committees and associations around town, involvement in our communities, involvement in our schools, involvement in our business, that the only way to bring about real change and to have greater impact is to run for elected office. I feel as being mayor of our city, I can work with all the great folks I've met along the way who really want to bring about change. We need change at our leadership. We need change in our relationships around the region. We need the ability to work together and to move forward into our promising future that we have right in front of us. Thank you. James Donaldson for mayor. Thank you. So we now move on to what we call round one, specific questions for each of the candidates. We're going to go in order from you, Mr. Donaldson, on up. 90 seconds to answer, and I'm beginning with you. James Donaldson, tell us 
Why or what in your past experience qualifies you to be mayor of Seattle? My background includes one of intense involvement with various teams, managing people in business, being on teams as we strive to work towards our goals, and being able to achieve our goals. This is what it's all about. We have specific goals laid out for our city in the near future. How are we going to reach those goals? By working together, by having our strategic plans in place that we continue to move towards and implement. We can't afford any more wasteful spending. We have to be efficient with our dollars, our tax dollars. We have to be efficient with our bonuses that we pay out in this economic downturn. We have to be efficient with our infrastructure that we're investing in. This is what I'm bringing to the table, the ability to run a city and manage people and work, most importantly, with people in every capacity, in every variety along the way. I, I, I pride myself in the ability to stick to it. As a professional athlete, I, pay, I played 20 years as a professional athlete. The average career is only three and a half years in the NBA. That takes a lot of determination, a lot of stick to itiveness, a lot of the ability to overcome the challenges and the ups and downs that are going to come as part of the job. I understand that. I know not every day is going to be a rosy, sunny day. I know there's going to be challenges ahead, but I'm prepared to meet those challenges because I have a goal in mind and I have a strategy that works, and I will implement those strategies to make sure they work for the best of our city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jan Drago, in 90 seconds, you have many uh, similar, if not identical, political stances to the mayor. What makes you different? Well, let me start with I believe the basic difference. And the basic difference, when people ask me what qualifies you to be an elected official, what, what should your background be, I say a full life experience. And I've had practice, I've worked in the private sector as well as the public sector, starting as a small business owner in high school. I was a preschool kindergarten teacher, Head Start. I came to Seattle and opened my own business here, Hagen das Ice Cream Ship business, and now I've spent 16 years on Seattle City Council. So I have many, many experiences in terms of um, working on issues, and let's just use transportation as an example. That is the single most important issue to the people of this region, and the mayor and I have worked together because it takes a mayor and a council working together to make the, comp the big accomplishments on big projects. There are many issues that we have uh, disagreed on, and that certainly includes um, d cutting the gang squad, uh, it includes annexation, uh, industrial land zoning, incentive zoning, and I can go on, but there certainly are differences. Joe Malahan, are you cleaning or answering here? <laughs> okay. Uh, this goes to the public sector part of your resume. We've known you as a community organizer, that you worked uh, briefly for Congressman Al Swift as a, I believe, as a college intern. But what makes you qualified to become mayor of Seattle? Well, I think a, a mayor is someone who has management skills. It's someone who uh, is open and accountable and can bring diverse groups of people together. Uh, I have nine years of experience at T-Mobile, a very large company, and I've turned around parts of that business from uh, not profitable to very profitable. I've ideated and launched new businesses at T-Mobile. And when uh, leadership is looking for someone to solve a big problem, either an operational problem or a problem affecting customers, they often will turn to me. The way I operate is I bring a small group together to ideate a solution, and then I bring a larger group together of all the stakeholders, which in this case are departments. And in that uh, environment, I collect everyone's objectives, and everyone articulates the risks involved in a particular project. And what I found from my community organizing skills is that you listen. You listen to people and you feed back what they say to you. And then when you make a decision, you're honest with them. Hey, Jane, I know you have a certain objective. 
I'm not meeting it with this decision. We'll get to it next time. And when you take that approach, open, accountable, inclusive, even people who disagree with the decision get behind you and you move forward and you succeed. I think that is the kind of management experience we need in city government. Mike McGinn, uh, you've never held elected office or run a major corporation. What makes you qualified to be mayor? You know, I have long experience working within the community to create change in ways that really um, resonates with Seattle values. Um, I was a lawyer for 13 years at the law firm of Stokes Lawrence. I know what it means to work for businesses that are involved in disputes and help them out. Um, I was president of my Greenwood Community Council for years. We worked on getting sidewalks and smart development in our neighborhood. I formed a nonprofit called Great City, which brought together business leaders, environmentalists, um, neighborhood leaders to talk about how can we do growth well in the city. And we managed to put together a community coalition that put the parks levy on the ballot and passed it over the mayor's objection. Um, two years ago, when I was head of the, when I was deeply involved in the Sierra Club, um, the political leadership of the region told us we couldn't get light rail unless we spent billions on new highways. And what we did was we organized and we ran a no campaign against the roads and transit ballot measure. They spent five million, they spent 50,000, and we beat it. And this year we came back with light rail alone, which meant we didn't have those, those highways, the polluting highways, but we also had the resources available to work on the things we really need. So there's a long, I have a long record of working within communities, building coalitions, and creating political change. And I think anybody who's been around Seattle politics a little while, while knows uh, this town can be pretty contentious, and people disagree on things. And I've demonstrated a record of creating change that prepares us for the future, and I'd like to bring that record, uh, and I'd like to bring that leadership to the role of mayor. Mayor Nichols. Only Mayor Charles Royer has served three terms since the terms became four-year events. Why isn't it time for a change? Or stated another way, what specifically are you trying to accomplish in a third term? Well, Joni, I think that uh, one of the things that I have shown, um, and there's been a lot of talk about style uh, in this race, is that I am persistent, that I will follow um, where I believe the city should go, I will set an agenda, and I will carry that out. And a lot of the things that we're trying to accomplish in our uh, city and in our region take a long time. Light rail is an example. Uh, I have worked on that as a member of the King County Council and as mayor for 21 years. It shouldn't take that long, but it does take that long to get something like that accomplished. Uh, and within 15 years, we should have a system built out that will uh, uh, cover about 70% of the residences and 85% of the jobs in our region. I'm really proud of that. There are a lot of people who worked hard on that, but uh, none has worked as hard for as long as I have. And uh, the Alaskan Way Viaduct, we have debated that for the last eight years since the Nisqually earthquake. It takes a long time to get a decision in this region and in this state, and it takes a long time then to carry it out. So I think that uh, what I offer is an eight-year record of accomplishment. We've gotten a lot done. We've set the agenda in terms of uh, uh, the uh, housing levy, and there's a renewal of that coming up in terms of uh, family and education, fixing our libraries, our parks, our fire stations, uh, and I want to see through the things that we've started, uh, and I want to tackle a few more, again, based on the uh, foundation that we've built these last eight years. Norman Sigler, you have not run a, a major corporation or organization, nor have you been in elected office. What qualifies you to be mayor of Seattle? I think there are three things that qualify me to be mayor of Seattle. Uh, the first is my business acumen. I've worked at Alaska Airlines as a manager of finance and contracts on a $200 million budget, which is about a quarter of the size of the general fund of the city of Seattle. I've worked in finance and controller type operations and other co companies as well. Uh, that's one. Building relationships. Uh, I do that now professionally at a corporate level in terms of headhunting and recruiting. I also do that as a matchmaker. Uh, it sounds funny, but uh, people bringing people together, I think, is one of the more important things that one can do in their lives. And uh, the third thing is uh, my passion for the city of Seattle. I moved here six years ago, and I was awed by the beauty, awed by all the intelligent, passionate, articulate people, creative that lived here. But yet, there was something missing. There was that potential that wasn't being fulfilled. And the potential I saw was people weren't really coming together. Communities weren't really connected for whatever reason. 
And so my history of bringing people together, my history of understanding the numbers, uh, because I do that very well, and being creative, creative ideas of partnering with other parts of our community, partnering within our community. We have an excellent nonprofit uh, portion of our community. We have an excellent corporate uh, portion of our community, and our public sector is uh, bar nine. If we can get those three uh, tiers within our community working well together, this would be an amazing place to live, and we could change the world, uh, and that's what I want to do for the city of Seattle. Thank you. Thank you so much. On to round two. This is a single question. All the candidates will have a chance to answer it and we'll repeat it as we go. We know that all mayors strive to strike the right balance between setting out and achieving a great vision on one hand and on the other, delivering the basic services that are needed to keep the city running. How do you intend to accomplish both of these goals? Norman Sigler, you're up again. I'm up again. <laughs> I should just stand up, stay up. Uh, vision versus getting things done, uh, basic service delivery. One of the key things of delivering great service for the public as public servants would be creating an atmosphere where people, employees want to come to work or are passionate about doing their job and doing a great job uh, for the city. So one of the proposals that I have on my platform is to get the employees, the 10,000 plus employees out into the community every month, every other month. Uh, that way that they can listen to what the public actually wants out of their servants and open up 10,000 plus more lines of communication between the community and the city. Uh, another thing that I want to do in terms of my vision, we need to have an understanding of what the vision is for Seattle. It, are we to be a green city or are we, are we to be the most intelligent city on the planet? Uh, I would say the vision, I want to be the most educated city on the planet from top to bottom. Continuous education from uh, zero through right before you uh, reach the grave. So that's what I intend to do. <laughs> Mayor Nichols, the vision thing against the basic services thing. Well, you need to uh, obviously do both. The basic services uh, that the city provides, uh, the public safety service being probably the most basic of all, transportation, libraries, parks, uh, human services, those need to be uh, done and done very, very well. But for a community to move forward, I think you also need to have uh, an idea of what your community's assets are and how you're going to put those to work. Here in Seattle, our number one asset as a community, I believe, is the University of Washington, the number one public research university in America. It provides thousands of very talented young people every year who go through the university and come into our economy. And it does research on some of the most perplexing problems that face uh, humankind, particularly in the life sciences. So you take a look at that and you figure out how do we tap into that? How do we use that to build a great future for our children and for our grandchildren? Uh, and by uh, doing that, you have both the basic services that people rely on in their day-to-day -day life, and you create a vision that moves us forward. Thank you very much. Mike McGinn. You know, I'm not sure that there's the dichotomy you express between vision and basics. You know, if you do the right things on the basics, you create the opportunities to um, make sure that we can thrive in a competitive world economy, that you can connect people to opportunity, um, that you can enhance social fairness, and that you can enhance our quality of life. In my platform, I put out three things that if we do these things right, we can achieve that. You know, great local school system and focusing resources on kids and families, so kids and families are, so children are safe, healthy, and ready to learn. Um, upgrading our internet infrastructure to connect us to the world economy, and having a great local transit system. You do all these things well, you can, you, you hit multiple objectives. I think the rate, the, the when you get into trouble with vision versus basics, is when you get hung up on some grand project that everybody thinks is, is, will be an achievement, but can actually harm you with everything else. In this case, spending $4.2 billion on a viaduct, $930 million of city tax funds, means we're not going to be able to take care of the basics that will really help us achieve our long-term vision. Thank you. Joe Malahan. My vision for city government really is simply to deliver basic services better than we do today. Taxpayers deserve to have services delivered efficiently. We pay for them, we deserve that. You know, uh, I think my vision is that when a community wants to uh, stand up against crime, I will ensure that they can get crime stats 
without having to fi file a public record request. That should just be a simple service. When senior centers in Seattle are doing lunches for seniors, the staff under my administration won't have to worry about whether there's enough food to serve lunches to all the seniors who decide to show up that day to meet and be with friends. When a mom in Seattle wants to take her kids to the park, I'll ensure, or work to ensure, that sidewalks are present for her so she doesn't have to take her stroller out into the street. This is my basic vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Drago. Well, I'd like to, oops, I got your mic. I guess that's okay. Um, We're gonna I'd like separate to you two in a minute. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I put them together, they'll stay together forever. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it's all about community. So I'd like to share my vision for Seattle. And my vision for Seattle is that every boy and girl, every man and woman will thrive and be able to meet their full potential. And that begins with prenatal care for pregnant women, continuing with Parent, uh, parenting help, universal preschool education, quality education and training to prepare our young people for the 21st century jobs, affordable housing, and access to health care for all. Now that's a big vision, but I believe that we can achieve that within a, gener within a generation in Seattle. And what how do we get there? We get there taking one step after another, incrementally, step after step after step. But that's the goal and that's the long-term vision. Thank you. James Donaldson. Delivering basic services versus a big vision. I believe in big visions. I'm a big guy. You are. <laughs> See that wingspan on me? I can reach from here to there. But I want to make sure my vision is always realistic, attainable, achievable, and within the time frame that I say it will come within and fall within. Something that we can all work towards. Also, in delivering the basic services, we need to have a government that's streamlined, that's efficient, that's coming in under budget, and all the projects that we lay out there are going to be budgeted for and accounted for and transparent as much as possible. I'll go out and recruit the best talent available and make sure we're all around the table and making sure that we put our minds and brain power into each and every process that we're going to go to. I want to get away from politics as usual. I want to get away from the Seattle way. Whatever that means, that Seattle process, it doesn't work. It bogs things down for 20 years. It bogs things down for 16 years. It's way too much, and we need to do a better way. Thank you. It's now time for the lightning non-verbal round. You each have in front of you cards that say yes, no, or if you dare, waffle. And when I ask the question, as soon as you can, raise the card which is appropriate. And I, for one, would appreciate an appropriate facial expression to go along with the card to help out if, if you'd like to add that. I would, that would be I would appreciate it if they'd hold it for a moment or two so people yes. can see it because it goes by really fast. Question number one, do you support district elections for city council? Question number two, do you think the city of Seattle should take over the Seattle School District? Oh wait, sorry, no, no, no. All right, question number three, will the deep bore bus tunnel come in on budget? Will the deep bore bus tunnel come in on budget? Bus tunnel? Bus tunnel? Bus the, tunnel? The, no, I'm sorry, the car tunnel. The viaduct tunnel. We're going to make it a transit tunnel, Mike. <laughs> Next, do you support the bag tax or fee if you prefer? Okay. We're going to stay with transit. This is a two part question. In the rare occurrence of inclement weather in Seattle, do you support the use of sand? Sand. Okay. Part two. Do you support the use of salt? All right.
mind. Recently, the city of Seattle, under Richard uh, Conlon's leadership, changed regulations to allow for food growing in those planting strips in front of residential properties. The city held two community meetings on urban agriculture to talk about future action. So my question for you is, do you support putting more resources, including city staff time, toward expanding access to urban agriculture? Yes, no, or waffle? OK. Do you think that taxpayer revenue should be spent to renovate Key Arena? days are gone, huh? <laughs> okay. That's pretty Do you support city parks being created by paving over reservoirs? Paving, paving over? Paving over? Covering. Paving over. Covering. Capping. Capping. Yeah. Capping. If you prefer. And the last question in our lightning round, should Grace Krunikin at the Seattle Transportation, uh, Department of Transportation be fired? No vote? No, I, no I'm not, I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do in a panel like this. It's not. It's not. Protest duly recorded. Good for you. Moving on to round three. These are specific questions for each of you, individual questions. I begin with you, James Donaldson. Uh, each, each of you have 90 seconds on this. WAMU is gone. There's talk of Boeing further pulling out, maybe going to South Carolina. What is the mayor's role in bringing in jobs, and would you help ensure our citizens have the resources they need to retool for a green economy? The mayor's responsibility and role in bringing in jobs is to be a advocate for our city, to make sure that the mayor is the visible face and welcomes all who want to invest in our city, welcomes all who want to visit our city via tourism and trade, and to continue being involved with any negotiations and so that big companies such as WAMU and such as what Boeing's threatening to do don't pick up and move out of town without us really, really having a say in the matter. A mayor has to be proactive and really have the big picture in mind of what will happen once one of these economic drivers fall out of our region. It's nothing but bad news. And so we need to keep the big picture in mind. We need to make sure that we're proactive. We need to make sure we negotiate in good faith. And we need to make sure we're around the discussion table, even when the grumbling starts and not afterwards and be caught in that reactive mode that we are so often caught up in. The mayor also has responsibility of bringing jobs to the city and creating jobs, helping our small business communities especially, and our large business communities with their needs and with their issues, helping with tax structure, helping with permitting processes, licensing processes. These are all things that can be streamlined and efficient, and they fall right at the mayor's feet. He or she really needs to be involved in those things. I'm the kind of mayor who will do those kind of things. Thank you. Jen Drago, in, in 90 seconds, uh, I want to go back to the housing levy, which the city council has approved to help the homeless. It calls for a sales tax increase. You originally wanted it to be lower, but you ended up voting for the higher tax rate. Why? Well, I wanted to right size the housing levy so that it could pass. So I felt that it had a much better chance of passing at a lower um, rate. It's on the ballot now for $140 million, and that raised people's taxes almost $80 for an average, uh, or raise it up to almost $80 for an average um, home from 40 to 80. So I proposed $120 million, and it would have raised it, I think, to about 60. So my goal was to make certain that the tax passed. That was my highest priority. Uh, and my colleagues did not support me in that. So I supported the housing levy because it is the single most important thing that we do in the city for housing. It gets used by many, many, it, it, it's used as um, leverage and in partnership with many different um, nonprofit housing organizations. So it's very important that it passes. But I'm very concerned about raising taxes on for our citizens in this economic climate. 
That's a perfect segue. Joe Malahan, you have called for a more affordable city. Can you offer three specific steps that you would take to accomplish that goal? Well, I think first uh, our city needs to be more affordable to conduct business. Businesses in Seattle have a tremendously higher uh, overall cost burden than businesses in our uh, neighboring cities of Bellevue, Everett, Tacoma, and the like. I've uh, been publicly, I've publicly called for a repeal of the head tax, uh, which is a tax on creating jobs. And I think we have to think further about the revenue structure and what makes sense and what is fair uh, for individual burden, burden and business burden. I also think uh, f affordability, uh, we, we have to increase the housing stock in Seattle. Workforce housing, even low income housing that traditionally could have been affordable in the 70s or 80s have become unaffordable because professionals are buying small bungalows and the like because professionals want to live in Seattle. And so I think we need to work to increase the housing stock. The incentive zoning laws are well intended, but they're not very strategic in nature. I think they're actually incentives to build fewer housing units rather than more. I do support the housing levy. I think that's my third thing in terms of affordability because uh, the levy uh, does achieve and has achieved in the last time, I'm sorry, am I out? Uh, good, affordable housing. Our one night count on homeless this year was flat, which I think is an accomplishment for the city and the county. And so uh, we got to increase housing stock, but at the same time, do spend on uh, low income housing. So I do support the levy. Mike McGinn, you say that Seattleites don't want a, a tunnel to replace the Alaskan Way viaduct, but uh, aside from your own uh, polls and from <laughs> the 1997 vote against the tunnel, which was a very different tunnel, why do you think Seattleites are against this tunnel? I'm sorry. That was a 2007 vote, and it was almost 70 percent of the public voted against it, and it still goes underground, and it still costs billions of dollars. I don't think the circumstances have really changed at all. Um, and polling does show the public still opposes it, and that mirrors the position I've had for, for years against it. And I'd like to explain why I'm against it. Um, it costs too much. It's not a transportation solution. It doesn't, it doesn't help our environment either. Um, and it threatens every other priority we have in Seattle. Um, I'll tell you, when I go out there and talk to the public about my opposition to the tunnel, I find lots of agreement because they get it. They get it. It's $4.2 billion is the, is the total cost of the project. $930 million, and we're talking about raising property taxes, utility rates, um, parking fees, and, and additional taxes. That $930 million in city resources is almost equal to every property tax levy we're paying right now for libraries, parks, housing, fire stations, et cetera. And we have a budget right now that's in a crunch. We're cutting Metro Transit by 20% uh, when ridership is up 20%. We have a community policing plan that requires more officers than we have now. Um, we have people in need, housing needs, uh, social services, and all of those things are gonna be cut. Well, we put $930 million of city taxpayer monies into a tunnel that doesn't serve our transportation needs, our environmental needs, or economic needs. So yeah, I'm pretty confident the public agrees with me on this. That's why I'm running on it, and that's why I'm standing up for that position. Mayor Nichols, your recent TV ad talks about the fact that you have made some mistakes while in office. All of us do in our daily lives. What is the biggest mistake you've made as mayor, and what did you learn from it? Well, in my uh, eight years as mayor, I've had an opportunity to make numerous mistakes, <laughs> and uh, I would say that there are a couple weeks in December that I would love to have back. Um, I will, in my own defense, say that out of eight years, two weeks in December is uh, uh, regrettable. We have learned from that, uh, and I think that's the important thing. As human beings, we make mistakes, especially if we try and do things that haven't been done before. We try new approaches. And the key is for you to learn from it, not repeat it, and not be afraid to try new things in the future. Norman Sigler, what would you do as mayor to address the issue of crime? One of the things that we need to do uh, to address crime is to become more connected to communities where, there, where crime happens. Uh, crime is prevalent in 
certain sections of our city, the Belltown area, the corridor all the way down to the courthouse, the south part of Seattle, central part, Pike Pine, occasionally central district. Uh, we need to be involved in those communities. Uh, we need to put resources in those communities. I would love to see more police presence, but not police uh, presence where there's animosity between the people that they're trying to protect and the police. Uh, we need to have engagement. We need to focus on the children that are involved in crime. What I would do as mayor, I would talk to the people that are committing the crimes. I would talk to the gang people who and sit down with them to understand what is the motivation behind your need to use violence in our community and have, have them understand that it's not acceptable in this t day and age to do that and help them channel that energy into other avenues for success for them, uh, whether it's starting their own businesses. Everything's a gang. Uh, Microsoft, they're a gang of people. They're ganging up against Google. <laughs> they are. And so we need to help them um, help those people understand you don't use guns to do that you can use your brains and everybody has brains and so i would encourage them to look at all the other successful gangs out there and help them emulate that so that's what i would do for uh, violence in this community norman i'm going right back to you she might stay there also this will be our last round round four so start to think of your questions or your follow-ups to the answers which you have already heard we'll be going to you after this round the set last round is a single question for each of you, and you'll have 60 seconds to respond. And the question is, what do you see as the next most compelling transportation priority down the line? All right. Well, for me, it's we need train transit service built in the city of Seattle. The monorail, I voted for that monorail every time, even when the price tag doubled. But I think we went around about it the wrong way. We shouldn't have created a separate agency to create the monorail for the city of Seattle when we already have an agency in the region building train transit service. We should have partnered, contracted that $5 billion, which was the most recent yes vote, with Sound Transit so they could build train transit service in the city of Seattle. West Seattle, Ballard, they need train transit service to connect them to downtown, especially when that viaduct is under construction or the replacement of the viaduct is under construction. And also, it's a win-win for the community. My whole campaign is all about partnerships. Government cannot do everything by itself. We need to work together within our community and between communities. So if Sound Transit had built, used that $5 billion to become more of an expert, we wouldn't have wasted the $100 million of taxpayers' money. Sound Transit would have become more experts uh, in building train transit in the region, which would have benefited the entire Puget Sound. Greg Nichols, what should be the next transportation priority for Seattle? Well, I think that the, um, the thing about transportation in Seattle is to understand it needs to be a balance, that shoving more vehicles through neighborhoods is not what transportation is about. It's building communities and communities where people have choices of how they get around, sidewalks that they can walk on, bicycle lanes that they can ride on safely, a transit system that can get you where you want to go, and the regional network of light rail that uh, I am so proud to have worked on uh, over these last 21 years that allow us in 15 years to see a fundamental transformation of how we think about getting around our city and our region. Mike McGinn, what do you think is the next transportation priority for Seattle? I think the biggest issue is how do we figure out how to integrate our transportation financing sources and our transportation needs. Light rail is a huge success, but bus service, metro bus service, is about to be cut 20% next year. Where you know the state legislature has said, let's spend billions on a tunnel. We have a $60 billion statewide unfunded maintenance backlogs on, on our state highway system. Um, we also have uh, city streets that we don't have the resources to take care of. We have an unfunded bike plan, an unfunded bike master plan. So the real trick here is we've got to stop thinking about transportation as being one big project here and another big project there. But instead, we have to start thinking about how do we use the 26 percent of our city that's in public right of way to more efficiently move people using all modes? How do we use our interstate uh, freeway system, which connects all our urban centers in the region? How do we start using more transit on those? And that's, gonna, that's a much tougher problem than finding financing for one project. That's going to take a lot more regional cooperation and really rethinking what our priorities are for how we use our resources. Joe Malahan, what's the next big transportation priority for Seattle? Geez, Ross, you said challenge. Can I answer the first question? The next biggest transportation? Well, the priority is the priority. challenge. The priority is that we manage very well four or five really big projects that are about to launch. We've got Spokane Street rebuild. We've got viaduct replacement. 
We have uh, 520 expansion, light rail expansion. And we need to coordinate very well these projects so that we minimize the impact to traffic flow and to business activity. We need a manager who is skilled at juggling multiple projects and ensuring that multiple teams are in alignment and cooperating and communicating uh, together. I will, as the next mayor of Seattle, replace leadership in the Seattle Department of Transportation. There are too many red flags, the public knows it, and we have to make that change. I also think I have the most management experience of any member of this panel, and I think I'm the one to get these transportation projects done in a way that doesn't wreck our economy. Thank you. Jen Drago, the next big transportation priority for our city. Okay, well after eight years with the Alaskan, Vi Alaskan Way Viaduct, we finally have a decision and we have project funding. The next big priority after 15 years, we still don't have a decision and we don't have funding for SR 520. That's the next big priority. And we need to make the decision about the design on the west side of the bridge, which is the Seattle side, by the end of the year and go forward with the legislature to fund the project. Okay, it's your turn. After James Donaldson answers this question, uh, get ready to put your hand up and we'll have a microphone go to you. James Donaldson, the city's next transportation priority. What is Thank it? You. We need to ensure that the investments we've made in the projects that are on the table right now, 520, Spokane Street, Mercer Street, we need to make sure that these programs and these, these projects come together and integrate seamlessly. We cannot afford to be locked up in gridlock and God forbid something happens with the viaduct before any of these things get underway with a moderate to major earthquake that the feds will just come in and totally say shut it down and nobody's using it. We don't want to see that. So we need to be serious about it. We need to move forward with it quickly. We need to implement our plan smartly. I've lived around the world in great cities, Athens and Rome and Hong Kong, and I've rode these integrated systems for months and months on end seamlessly from 50 kilometers out all the way into the core of the city. That can be done ultimately, but we need to take care of business here first and make sure that the systems we have in place are working. Thank you. All right, audience, it's your part of the show now. I hope you're ready with some questions. Let me just review the rules for a quick second here. We do better without speeches. Actual questions are preferred. We prefer questions posed to individual candidates, but you might have one for two of them or something like that. We're, we're flexible. We can do that. Uh, we do have a mic tender. Ed Walker is here. We, have, we know we have questions out here. I spotted this young lady and over here so first. Here it goes. The way you do it is you raise, you raise your hand, and Ed comes running over. That was a light gate there. But anyway, he comes <laughs> over, and you start talking. First question, please. Hi, my name is Tamara in the 37th District, and this is a fantastic question from everyone. I would love for Nichols to answer it, but maybe Malahan too. Um, the question is, and, and if you don't have a, a smart answer and you just want to tell me, I'll get back to you, that's fine. Um, the topic is safety and rights. And this has to do with what happened after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, my second favorite city. And it also has to do with what recently took place in Congress when they were threatened with martial law if they did not sign the bailout. And I wanted to know if there was a natural or man-made catastrophe here, uh, even when we think of man-made, we can think, or sorry, man-made would be terrorism, maybe uh, natural would be an earthquake or swine flu, right? I uh, wanted to know how would you uphold the rights of the citizens here in Seattle if martial law is a reality that's being pushed on you by Homeland Security or by FEMA? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not a question we've had out on the campaign trail before. <laughs> So uh, I, I became mayor uh, on January 1st of 2002, so shortly after 9-11. And the idea of um, us being attacked was a very real one. And the idea of 
how do we protect our city and our people from that or from a natural disaster was really on the front burner. And so we have worked very hard to make us better prepared. We've created a new in, uh, emergency operations center, uh, state of the art, down uh, south of uh, uh, Yesler Street. We have uh, drilled on a lot of different scenarios, um, including snow. And um, uh, we have worked hard to try and figure out how do we organize our community to be independent during a disaster. For instance, if we had an earthquake the size of Kobe's 1995 earthquake, they had 197 fires break out uh, after that earthquake. That would be uh, something like um, six for every one of our fire stations. So um, we would be struggling to try and keep up with that, and we'd need people to be independent and be organized within their neighborhood. And recognizing what happened in Katrina, we have particularly reached out to communities that uh, would struggle, uh, senior citizens, uh, folks who, uh, whose language is uh, a language other than English, uh, low-income communities, to make sure that they are not left behind in the way that we saw people left behind in New Orleans. Have not dealt with the issue of martial law, but I think to the extent that you provide support to people, you let them know that you've, you've thought through what's going to happen and provide them some comfort that they're gonna get help uh, and that that help will be uh, forthcoming as soon as it's humanly possible. I think that you reduce those tensions and you have people uh, better able to care for themselves while they're waiting for that help. I would be very, very hesitant to support martial law in any emergency that I can envision uh, Seattle experiencing. I think martial law in Katrina had a lot to do with the breakdown of city government. And uh, in any event, what we want to be able to rely on are our first responders. We need to make sure that they're adequately staffed and they're adequately trained. Five days after Katrina, I was in an emergency response center in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And quite honestly, Hattiesburg was sort of second level impact. Uh, but I was there and I saw good government and good preparation. There was a clear plan, they were well trained on the plan, and city and county leaders were there on the front lines ensuring we were executing on that plan. Last Labor Day, Hurricane, Hurricane Hugo threatened the Gulf Coast. I spent the weekend on the front lines ensuring that prepaid customers could use their phones in that emergency. Focus on the people, get on the front lines, and make sure the problems are addressed. Thank you. I, I just take Mike Tender's prerogative here. And wow. I, we have a lot of questions out here, and if we could have the rest of the candidates very succinctly answer this question, and then, of course, try to direct the questions to one candidate, we'll get in a lot more questions out here, because there's a lot of folks who do have questions. Okay. So. Then did you all well, want to go? I'll cede okay. my time to audience questions. Yeah, we're, I think we're ready yeah. for more audience They might be ready Great. to move on. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, my name is Peter Masundere, also from the 37th District. And we had a forum last night, which was attended by more than 300 people. And Mr. Mayor, we greatly missed you. Uh, the question I have is uh, to Joe Malhan and the Mayor. We recently lost our Chief of Police to the other Washington. Uh, under your leadership as mayor, what role would you, the community and neighborhood have in selecting the next police chief? Well, and I was very proud to serve uh, with uh, Gil Kurlikowski for seven and a half years. He did an outstanding job as our chief, um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of the job he's doing back in Washington for President Obama, and I think we'll get some more sane drug uh, policy as a result of his service there. Uh, I think that it's a <coughs> very important appointment and there should be broad community involvement in that appointment. And so uh, I will be uh, in the very near future announcing a, a broad-based committee. We took a look at what uh, Mayor Rice did when he hired Chief Stamper and what Mayor Schell did when he hired a Mayor, or, uh, Chief Kurlikowski. And, uh, and we will have a broad base of community support on that committee to look at the process and the candidates and then at the point at which we have finalists, uh, we will take those around to the community uh, and uh, have an opportunity for the community to, to meet those candidates. 
I generally, I generally agree with that approach. You have to have community leaders involved. Um, I, I've spoken a lot, Peter, in the past about enabling communities to be empowered to influence City Hall, so I think you know that's my ethic. The only thing I think I would add is that um, I would have a bias for promoting from within. Any good organization filling a position of that seniority should look for the very best candidate, but it should certainly give an opportunity uh, to, to look at the key candidates uh, already in the department. And I think the community uh, is very, very useful in that regard to, uh, to evaluate those candidates. I think that's good policy, it's good morale. That would be my approach. Next question from the audience. Hi, my name is Nathan Hambly. I was, this one's directed to Mayor Nichols. Um, there, are, there are several candidates who haven't yeah. had a chance what, to The other candidates <laughs> would like to share, I think. I think. How about Joe Mal Malahan? You can weigh in on this. Um, I just wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to find out what you thought about the state of Seattle's schools and what you would do to improve them. Was that ultimately directed at, at me? Okay. Um, I have, uh, I, think a, I think the mayor has a couple of roles with the schools. Uh, one is the family and education levy that we passed in 2004, which was a renewal that provides support outside of the classroom so the kids get there ready to learn. I have chaired, uh, along with my wife Sharon, who is here, the last uh, couple of levy campaigns. And that hasn't just been an honorary thing, I've raised money to help pass those levies so that those, that fundamental operating support is there. One of the things that encourages me about uh, the Seattle schools today is this superintendent, unlike her two predecessors, has come and said, we have a district that has problems and we need to fix them. And that's true. We have some schools that are just great and we have some that are pretty cruddy. And wherever you live in the city, whatever zip code you live in, you ought to be confident that what the school that your child is assigned to is a great school. That's how we're going to have the kind of uh, talent in our city to be able to uh, fill the great 21st century jobs in these incredibly uh, creative and innovative companies that make their home here. That's how we're going to create a, profit, a uh, prosperous future for our children. And this is going to be a moderator's prerogative. I'm going to jump in and ask for questions from the audience for some of the other candidates. So, um, Mike Tender, where are candidate. you? My name is Scott Foretel. My question goes to Mr. McGinn. Sir, in the event the housing levy goes down, the need for housing uh, continues. What would you do, what would you propose to do should the levy fail? Yeah. Well, I support the levy and I sure hope it doesn't fail. Um, and I think we've, we would have to look at, we have an even more immediate problem and you've probably seen it around town. Um, with the bad economy, there's many, many more people in, you know, very temporary housing situations, you know, essentially homeless. You know, up where I live on North Aurora Avenue, you can find campers parked. If you go down Airport Way, you can find campers and pick up trucks. And so a lot of people in need right now. I don't know that we've really confronted that yet um, and really thought about the amount of resources we're going to have to mobilize in order to provide stable temporary shelter for people because if you don't provide people you know stable temporary shelter um, they don't have the the wherewithal they don't have the support for them to go and do the other things they need to do so I, I think at a, at a bare minimum we really need to start focusing on that obviously if we didn't have the resources of the housing levy we'd have to take another look at how do we uh, raise the money to maintain our commitment to subsidized housing in the city whether whether renewal of the levy you know whether going to the voters again uh, whether looking at some other taxing sources, seeing what we could do out of the general fund. And again, this ties back to if we're committing all that money to a tunnel, how do we commit to a housing, uh, to our housing, local housing needs? Uh, Councilwoman Drago has asked to answer here and then we'll move on to the next question. Well, I'd reduce the amount of the levy and put it back on the ballot. Thank you. That was succinct. Next question from the audience. We have one here. It is for Jan Drago, but she made such a short she answer to that, we'll give her another short question here. Uh, hi, Councilwoman Drago, Thomas Goldstein here. Uh, in your blueprint under the public safety and youth violence section, you talk about increased training and job opportunities for young people. Could you talk about three organizations you would fund? Increased job opportunities for young people? 
under the uh, policing? Well, one in particular that I, that I was thinking about in, uh, is um, Neighborhood House. And they do have a program there where they work with um, young people that are involved in drugs and gangs and train them in technology. So that's one program that I can, um, that I can name. But let me talk about what I would do in terms of youth um, and gang violence. First of all, I would restore the gang squad, which the funding has been cut. It went from 27 members to seven members. I would restore that, and that's traditional policing. Then I support the mayor and the council's youth gang prevention program, which deals with kids on uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade trying to prevent them from getting involved in gangs. But I would add a third piece to that, the third uh, leg of the stool. And that is I would try to deal with the actual um, gang members that are on the streets with the guns causing the violence, doing the killings, the shootings, and the drive-bys. And there's a new program, or there's a program that's being used in several major cities in the United States very successfully. It's called um, oops, um, Ceasefire. And we had speakers come to the city just recently to talk about it. It's a massive intervention program. You identify the gangs, you identify the gang members, you bring together the community, law enforcement, families, and victims, and you do an intervention, one gang member at a time. And they're told they can make one phone call to get help, and, and they would know what those, that help and service was available to them. Then they're told the if any member, you, okay, if any place. member of their gang uh, kill somebody, law enforcement will come down totally and completely on that entire gang. And that is working effectively in other cities in the United States, and we need to try it too. Thank you. Okay, another question? Hi. Um, my name is Jane Freitag Kuntz. I'm a nurse with over 30 years of experience in public health and maternal infant health. And I'm concerned about the lack of infrastructure and financial support for social and health services. So I'd aim my question at, at Mr. Donaldson. What would you do to provide sustainable funding for social and health services? One thing I would do, Jane, thank you for the question, is to really understand the exact need that's out there. I think a lot of our social service agencies that are out there, we have sometimes little to no idea exactly how efficient they are, what the monies that they are being provided by the city or by the government. And so we need to make sure that through an audit review, their performance audits, that their performance is at a level that's acceptable, they're meeting the criteria, and then to make sure that we budget accordingly for that. I'm a big believer in making sure that we take care of those amongst us who have difficulty taking care of themselves. Everyone in this room is very, very privileged to be here. We've worked long and hard to get to these points in our lives. But there are a lot of folks outside this room who are really in need of various basic services, living day to day, trying to just get through to the next meal. Our city has a responsibility. Each and every one of us have a responsibility to make sure that those folks are taken care of as mayor my main responsibility would be to make sure that we budget accordingly and we stay right with the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Another question. Yeah, right here. Oh, right here. Thank you. Uh, we hear the words uh, neighborhood and community uh, used very often, very positive words. And in this recent real estate bubble we've had, we've uh, seen many new developments of different types. The two dozen or so high-rise condominiums in downtown Seattle, the complete redevelopment and mixed use uh, uh, in Green, uh, um, excuse me, uh, Northgate. And then you see the, uh, the many uh, townhomes, or some people call it town blight, mushrooming up throughout the city. What do you see as positive developments that you would like to see continue? And what do you see as just part of this, this bubble that maybe we should start to restrict? I would direct this to, to uh, both Mr. McGinn and Mr. Donaldson. Thank you. You know, it's undeniable that if we continue to be a job-producing center, which we want to be, more people will move here. And a lot of these folks are people that will be our friends, neighbors, or, or they may be our families as well. So we have to figure out how to provide a mix of housing types 
for the people that want to move here. Um, we've had some good examples of, of building in this town, and we have a lot of bad ones. Um, but we don't need to focus just on the buildings. I think a key thing is that that's what we focus too much on. Um, and by the way, I, I would just rewrite the whole multifamily code, and I think we really do make, take a look at how we do apartment buildings. We tend to produce things that are similar and not very nice. But I think we need to expand the discussion to talk about how do we invest in the parks and open space, the great local transit, you know, the streetscapes, um, the investments in schools that make a community that, are, that, are, that, are, that the buildings fit into. And, and I think we focus a, a little too much time on the buildings and the new people that, in the new housing, and not on how to create a great neighborhood. And um, that's one of the reasons I was so proud to support the parks levy last year, one of the reasons I support great local transit. Um, because if you, do, if you do all those things right, um, I think we'll find that we'll have a lot stronger neighborhoods. We have time for just one more long question or two real short ones, so we'll see how it goes. Where is it? Right here. I think he asked that. Of oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Please proceed. Barring any kind of catastrophic event, people will continue moving to Seattle and to our greater Northwest. It's projected that we'll have 1.2 million people over the next 20 years moving to our Puget Sound area. We need to really be smart and intelligent and collaborative with our neighbors and communities in how we're going to house them and feed them and employ them. My ideal is to take a look at each and every one of our neighborhoods around Seattle. They're all distinct. They all have their neighborhood charm and their, and their historical aspects to them that make them who they are. And so we need to make sure we take that in consideration. The city needs to have a listening ear and an open mind to how to build according to what a neighborhood already looks like, but also build for the projected growth that we will have. Build aesthetically pleasing buildings that don't, that don't become a blight on the neighborhood, that look great, that house more people in an efficient manner. Okay, time for one question for one person, and then we will let the candidates do their closing statements. We have one more question here. I'm sorry, did we have time for one more? I think for just one quick question, quick question. to one person, yes. Hi, uh, Chuck Wolf. I'm a land use environmental lawyer in town. Uh, Councilman Drago, you've uh, sort of championed the notion of regionalism and uh, looking beyond I'm, Seattle. Can you, can you speak louder? Okay, thank you. Councilman Drago, you've championed the notion of regional, regionalism excuse me, and the ability to look beyond Seattle boundaries, work with those outside of our city limits, and you haven't had a chance to talk much about that today, so I wonder if you'd take the opportunity. Real tight. Okay. Uh, if I am elected mayor on November 3rd, the first, thing, the first thing I will do on November 4th is convene a King County summit of elected local and state leaders to put together a legislative agenda for the 2010 legislative session, items that we can work together with. Okay. It's time for you to close the deal with these voters. Um, 60 seconds for your final statements. We'll begin with you, Norman Sigler. I was almost falling asleep over here. <laughs> <laughs> Next Excuse time I know me. to bring some people to plan some questions in the audience. <laughs> I love this city. Uh, this city is full of amazing, talented people, and we should all want to come together and work together to create a city that has never been seen in the history of the world. And I think we can do that. We've got the talent here. We've got the resources here, natural and otherwise, financial resources. And we should come together to make that happen. My platform is to focus on transportation, education, and the economy by partnering. Uh, we can't do it alone. Again, I'm going to say this until I'm blue in the face, if you can see the blueness in my face. Uh, we cannot do this by ourselves. We have to work with one another. Uh, my position on working together as an example in government is to reduce our health care costs by partnering with every city in the state of Washington, all the counties and the state, to create one health care plan that offers choice for all of our governmental employees. It will reduce our health care costs, health care costs that have gone up 40 percent just for this city in the last four years. So Sigler for Seattle, I appreciate you checking out my campaign, learning more about who I am. I, I won't let you down. Thanks. Greg Nichols, your final statement. Thank you, Ross. <clears throat> and before I start, I wanted to correct one thing. You had asked Councilmember Drago earlier about the housing levy, and you said that she had voted for a sales tax increase. The housing levy is not a sales tax. It is a property tax. Thanks it doesn't have anything to do. So uh, it's, a, uh, again, a pleasure to be here with you this evening. 
I think that the question that we all uh, need to be thinking about as we decide who is going to lead the city for the next four years is um, uh, how are we going to make the difficult decisions that need to be made to move our city forward? And there are difficult decisions. Uh, we had a couple of uh, candidates talk about the Seattle process and how uh, that doesn't work. Well, Seattle is not a broken city. Seattle is a city that people want to live in, that great companies call home and start here. And our challenge is the challenge of dealing with success. How do we have affordable housing when so many people want to live here and are willing to uh, pay uh, for that housing in order to do so? How do we make sure we have a transportation system that allows people to get around when we have a lot of jobs and a lot of people uh, jockeying for that space? How do we make sure that we are a safe city and that we have great schools? I have a track record of eight years of showing that I am willing to make those hard decisions even when they're not popular. That's what we're going to need is to create, create a great deliberative plan for our city and have the courage to carry it out. Mike McGinn, your final statement. One minute, please. Thank you. Um, uh, first, a clarification. When asked whether I wanted to take over the school system, I couldn't bear to hold up that negative term, waffle. Um, but I do believe that we should look seriously at taking over, uh, having direct mail responsibility for the school system because I believe we have a system on schools right now where we don't really hold anyone accountable nor do we hold each other accountable. So if we don't make progress, we should look at that for accountability reasons. And this is a theme that I think goes through all the work I've done. When I worked in my neighborhood of Greenwood, I worked to hold the whole community accountable to the type of new development we got. It's not government versus the community. It's how do we work together to get what we want. In the Sierra Club, when we fought roads and transit, was how do we hold ourselves accountable to our goals to reduce global warming pollution and, and build the future we want? And that was the thesis behind, that was the why I founded Great City. How do we hold each other accountable to this vision we have of a city that we all want to live in? And I want to take that same attitude towards mayor. I want to tap into the creativity, compassion, and intelligence of the people in the community. Let's hold ourselves accountable to build that city we believe in. Joe Melihan. The Seattle Times actually quoted one of the incumbents, and not the mayor, as a stating, the whole strategy is to block Malahan. I couldn't be more flattered. Uh, I am a threat to the status quo. I have five Democratic organization endorsements within the city of Seattle. I am the only candidate on the Diaz to have obtained the, ra the rating of outstanding, the only candidate, the rating of outstanding from the Municipal League. I gotta tell you, I respect that organization. <laughs> I'm a lifetime Democrat. I'm a progressive, but I'm also a pragmatic manager. My goal is to run the city more efficiently so that we can take care of people, take care of the environment, and I think Seattle will agree. Thanks for your time today. Jen Drago. Well, different leadership styles produce different results. And I'd like to use my leadership style and skills to restore the confidence and trust of the citizens, the neighborhoods, our elected regional and state leaders in city government. Elections are about the future. We have not heard a lot about the future in this campaign. I did share my vision with you, and I invite you to pick up this book as you leave the, uh, the room. It's called The Blueprint for Our Future. So I shared the big picture, and this speaks about many small steps that we can take for a better future in Seattle. So I invite you to join with me to build a better future for all of Seattle. James Donaldson, your final statement. Thank you. Thank you, City Club, for the invite and the opportunity to participate in tonight's gathering. Hey, this is about change and leadership. It's about moving us forward into a great future that lies ahead of us. It's not about talking until I'm blue in the face. It's not about talking and getting away from the Seattle way. We need to change the way we are. It's not about, uh, you know, being heavy laden in endorsements because I am beholden to no one. 
I come in here and I want to work for the, the all-American city of Seattle and the taxpayers who live here. It's not about style. It's about substance. It's about really doing the best job possible. I will recruit citywide, regional-wide, for the best people available. There are folks in this room that will be on my A-team. There are candidates along the candidates trail I've met who will be on my A-team. We will put together the best team possible and move us forward to the greatest future we could possibly have. Thank you. And my thanks to all the candidates for being really good sports tonight. And my thanks to the audience for good questions. This has been a most productive <laughs> evening. It is now my pleasure to introduce my boss, the editorial page editor of the Seattle Times, Ryan Blethyn. Well, don't have to raise this as high as you would, but just a little bit. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I think I was inside most of the day. I think it was kind of cloudy, but it kind of cleared up here at the end of the day. So I know it's not easy to uh, always be in here, but you know this is an important job, one of the most important jobs in the region. Um, when I say the region, just not the Puget Sound, but the Pacific Northwest. Um, so it's encouraging to see a, a looks like a full house here tonight. Um, and I want to thank the candidates. It was uh, lively and entertaining, and I hope illuminating for, for all the voters. Um, I also want to thank uh, Joni and Ross. You guys did an excellent job, as always. Um, and we did the City Club, uh, we did a debate with City Club last week for County Exec, and this is our second one this year with them uh, for Mayor. It's been a great partnership, and probably hope to continue that. And, you know, this is the primary, so we'll probably get another crack at at least two of you, um, you know, come, come, come the general. Yeah. I think that's a maximum also. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, is, it is. So, um, you know, unless, of course, everybody just falls by the wayside and, you know, drops out, but I highly doubt that. Um, but anyway, I'm just not going to waste any more of your time because it's still light out and you can still go enjoy yourselves. Um, so I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you.